Hello everyone, this is Cristina Gamboa, the CEO of the World Rebuilding Council. Thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of our circular built environment playbook report. It is undeniable that the way our economy's linear systems extract, transform, use and waste materials are causing immeasurable damage to the planet and our people. Our global network is taking action to increase awareness and accessibility of circular economy solutions by guiding all stakeholders in the built environment value chain towards sustainable, circular decision making. The building and construction industry is not only responsible for 37% of the world's carbon emissions, but hear this, also for nearly one third of total material consumption and a similar amount of waste. In 2022, a year's worth of biological resources were used just in seven months. An unimaginable 1.75 Earths would be, required, would be required to supply this level of demand per year. Urgent action is then required to both decarbonize the built environment, but also actively contribute to the regeneration of nature and ecosystems, which are vital to our health and our survival. This playbook presents then an overview of circular economy principles and strategies for the built environment and features market leadership and solutions from across our global network of green building councils and partners from our Circularity Accelerator program. With this playbook, we hope to make the complex principles of circular economy easy to understand. We have mapped out more than 20 strategies of implementing circular design, construction and operation for the built environment, illustrated with best practice case studies from around the regions of the world. The principles from this report can help guide industry decisions around minimizing the extraction of materials to more efficient designs using nature-based solutions to closing material loops at the end of the building's life cycle, all whilst providing socioeconomic benefit. We hope this will be an invaluable resource for all built environment stakeholders to guide a change in behavior from linear to circular. Of course, deep collaboration from all of us in the value chain will be key to catalyze action. But throughout the report, I am pleased to see our network joining forces to educate and upskill a wider audience on circular principles as sustainability solutions. So I want to thank our partners and again, Green Building Councils from our Circularity Accelerator program who have co-developed this report with us. And I hope those who are here with us today find the learnings from this playbook useful and that you're able to apply these principles to your own work and strategies to help accelerate a circular economy for a more resilient and sustainable future together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today is our first of two global launch events of our Circular Built Environment Playbook. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us here from different spots around the globe. We're delighted you can join us for an interactive session today where we'll be diving into the key strategies and principles for circular economy in the built environment with a range of fantastic speakers to help us out. A quick word of introduction from me. My name is Katrina Brady. I'm the Director of Strategy and Development at the World Green Building Council, and I'm speaking to you today from London. So in the next hour and 10 minutes, as I've said, we've got a fantastic array of speakers to share with you, to help us dive into this topic of circularity in the built environment. In a couple of minutes, we'll be handing over to Martin Lopez Cardozo to introduce us to this topic. And next we will hear from David Labersha of WSP, who's going to run us through the circular built environment playbook before we hand over to our wonderful panel. who will dive into the technicalities of this topic in more detail. This whole session, is live and interactive. So please do share your questions, your comments in the Q&A box. Uh, as people have flagged, the chat box uh, is not working for participants. So please use the, the Q&A box and take this opportunity to introduce yourself and share questions throughout. 
We will weave in as many as we can into the discussion today. Please note the session today is being recorded. And with that, please allow me to begin with a few words on our global network. The World Green Building Council Global Network is the world's most influential local, regional, global action network, leading the sustainable transformation of the built environment. We work with businesses, organizations, and governments to deliver on the ambition of the Paris Agreement and the UN Global Goals for Sustainable Development to achieve our vision of sustainable and decarbonized built environments for everyone, everywhere. Together with over 75 national green building councils and our partners from around the world, we are working to drive systemic change to take climate action, to enhance health equity and resilience, and to accelerate a circular economy. And that work is hosted through three flagship global programs, which speak to each of these strategic impact areas called Advancing Net Zero, Better Places for People, and the Circularity Accelerator, as you can see on screen. Today, of course, we'll be focusing on our Circularity Accelerator, but for more information on any of the above, please do see our website. Our Circularity Accelerator Global Programme was launched last May, and I would love to begin by thanking the 23 Green Building Councils and our six programme partners, as well as numerous additional industry partners and collaborators who've helped us so much to put together this playbook, which has been a long journey in the last year. It's a real exciting day to release that to the world. So thank you all very much. And here is a quick snapshot of the 23 Green Building Councils who I just mentioned, as well as some more of our partners. And you will find a map like this within the report, which has interactive functionality that will take you directly to each one of the Green Building Council's websites to access the work they're doing around the circular economy. So please do check that out. But with that, it's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Martin Lopez Cardozo, the CEO of Circle Economy, who's going to be giving us some opening remarks this morning. Martin is a serial entrepreneur who has built a number of successful companies in software, mobile and digital media and is based in the Netherlands. In 2020, Martin joined Circle Economy as CEO after serving on the board for several years. Before joining Circle Economy, he served as the CEO of Black Bear, a circular economy company that retrieves high value materials from end of life tires. He's a frequent speaker at conferences such as TEDx and Startup Fest, and Martine holds an MSc in Applied Physics from TU Delft and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Martine, hello, we're so honored to have you here today to introduce this topic for us all. Uh, to our participants, just before we hand over, there should be time for a couple of quick questions from Martine, so please do share any in the Q&A box. But for now, Martine, thank you, the floor is yours. Well, thanks and uh, a big congratulations on the uh, launch of the uh, playbook. Um, I think it really talks uh, to the fact that we're moving from the high level narratives into the practical solutions. And I think this is exactly what's needed. Um, so let me try to set the scene and share three numbers uh, with you all. First number is 100 billion. The second number is 7.2%. And the other one is almost 40%, actually 37. So 100 billion is the number, um, is the amount of virgin materials that are extracted uh, out of the earth every single year. So think about that for a second, 100 billion tons of materials. And just to put that a little bit into perspective, um, in the last six years, we have extracted more materials than the whole previous century combined. So it's also accelerating at a very dramatic, uh, at, at a dramatic, dramatic pace. The second number is 7.2%. Um, and that's actually um, the level of circularity from our circularity uh, gap report that we publish each year at the uh, World Economic Forum. It's a very crude measure, but it basically measures the amount of usable recycled uh, materials um, 
compared to the input of virgin uh, materials. And that number has actually been going down, unfortunately. So what's, what's happening there? What's happening is that the amount of new virgin extracting extractions actually grow or at a higher clip than what's been taken out of the economy at the end. So in other words, the linear machine is outpacing us. And the last number, and now I zero in onto the built environment, uh, is almost 40% or 37%, as Christina mentioned in her opening uh, remarks, which is the contribution of the built environment to global, global greenhouse gas emissions. But if you look at the other planetary boundaries, which was very much the focus of the circularity gap report uh, last year, actually this year, um, that's just one of the things we should be concerned about. There's a lot of other planetary, planetary boundaries, including things like biodiversity. And it was actually, if you look through the biodiversity lens, and Citra did a great report on that, the built environment is actually the second biggest contributor to the diminishing of biodiversity after food and agri. So number one category in greenhouse gas, number two category on biodiversity. So, <clears throat> So quite a big impact on the build environment. Um, so how can we address this uh, challenge? So on a high level in our circularity gap report, we basically have four basic strategies you can use. And I think you will see those strategies also in the, in the playbook, which is you know, very simple, use less materials, use them longer, use bio-based or regenerative materials. And then at the end of the cycle, recycle them in a, you know, a, as good way. So ideally not going back to the old materials, but ideally very much high on the R letter, very much high in value. And if you apply those four strategies across the four big categories, built environment, food and agri, mobility and manufacturing, you can actually stay within the, in, within the planetary boundaries and use about 30% less uh, materials. So that's sort of painting a little bit of the bigger picture. Um, and I think we'll go more detail on the built environment. Um, but before I hand it back to you, uh, Catriona, um, you know, some things you think about if you look at those four strategies are things like, you know, retrofitting, um, how can you sort of uh, use existing building stock and reuse it as opposed to digging up a lot of new materials and start from scratch. How can you use a more design regenerative approach um, to design and construction? Um, how can you use circular materials? How can you reuse construction and demolition waste? But also very much looking at the finance angle. How can we find enough uh, finance and structure the incentives the right way that it will actually unleash the capital that's necessary for the transition? So in summary, very excited about the playbook, really looking forward to the questions and back to you. Thank you so much, Martijn. Those stats really hit home. I think that's a great way for us to kick off with some numbers that bring these images to life. We have time for a question um, and I can see some comments coming in on the Q&A box and some super fans of Circle's work. So thanks for sharing that everyone. But the direction I'd like to go in asking you a question on what you've just said is to lean into the social side of circular economy. You mentioned obviously biodiversity of carbon emissions, but what are the social impacts of the circular transition in the built environment? And what are you guys at Circle doing about that? Yeah, that's actually a great question. And uh, I, I should have sp spoken about it a bit more. Uh, but at Circle, we believe that the social agenda um, is actually also at the heart of Circle economy. And actually, yesterday, we launched a big initiative together with the World Bank and ILO uh, on this uh, topic for all sectors. And of course, built environment is a very critical uh, sector. And I think it's important for two reasons. First reason is, if you don't address the social side, the circular transition will not happen because you will have unhappy people who are not properly skilled and you know the government officials will not be elected. Um, and the second reason to do that, it's also the right thing to do, right? We all talk about the just and fair transition, 
Um, and after the energy transition, the circular transition will be the next big one. So let's make sure we incorporate those principles in the agenda and make that also a critical element of the way we do it, uh, for instance, in your playbook. Thanks, Martin. I totally agree as well. We, we must be consistent in our messaging about this holistic sustainability that's good for people, planet, resources, biodiversity, everything together. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, we'll, we'll squeeze one more question in before we move on. And this is from Maria, who is asking, we need a new financial system for businesses. Yearly budget slash possibility to write a stock system doesn't work. What are your thoughts and suggestions? How can we be replacing our financial system on a regulatory level and business level? Yeah, big question. I know yeah, it's a great. Uh, that's the the, the million dollar uh, question, or maybe the the the, the, the hundred trillion dollar question. Um, and our approach to that is, you know, I think ultimately, I think we need to rethink our whole system, but that will not happen overnight. So I think you have to look at um, where you could do meaningful interventions and let you give you some examples. So I think, you know, in, um, in, in Europe and the US and some of the more, you know, developed nations, I think you need other type of interventions than you need in, in, in some regions in the global South, which are really building their economy. So what we're doing there, for instance, is working with all the multilateral development banks in uh, setting a circular finance roadmap. So if there's actually money being um, uh, borrowed to um, the developing nation or to projects, they actually look at it through a circular lens. And a lot of those financing actually goes into the, um, into the built environment uh, space. I think in, in, in the Western world, I think it's all about setting the incentives right. And if you start in including things like, you know, regulation, better carbon pricing, and things like that to fix the underlying business model, I think you already see a lot of movement. Thanks, Martin. A great answer for what is, as you say, the million dollar question. And I think the key with the incremental approach is that you have to start somewhere. And hopefully that's something that resources like our playbook and the many fantastic tools and resources Circle have provided help people to do. So thank you so much for your time this morning, Martin. We really appreciate you coming in and kicking off this webinar for us. So thank you very much. And with that, it's my pleasure to move into the next section of our webinar and to introduce our next speaker, who's going to fully introduce the Circular Built Environment Playbook and share some details of the real life case studies that are detailed in this publication. Again, we'll have a little bit of time to pick David's brain after the presentation, so please share any questions that come to mind in the Q&A box. But before we do that, it's my pleasure to introduce David Laversha, who is the leader of WSP Property and Buildings Global Net Zero Carbon Network at WSP. David is the Net Zero Lead in the WSP UK Property and Buildings Group and is responsible for the development of their strategy and implementation of the WSP UK Action Plan to have total carbon in their projects by 2030. David's passion stems from a deep-seated desire to transform the industry into the low carbon future required in response to the climate emergency. And this morning, he has the unenviable task of walking us through this playbook and taking us through all the principles of the circular economy in the built environment. David, thank you so much for being here, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much indeed for that lovely introduction. And uh, yeah, I just think I should say uh, it's been a pleasure working on this for the last year. Um, and I'm currently sitting um, in Leeds in the north of uh, England, just to give people some context. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to this landmark report and the presentation. Um, you know, w, WSP being a part of the World Green Building Council Circular Accelerator, um, which means myself and a colleague, Nicola Evans, have been working on this publication from first inception over a year ago. The purpose of this work is really to create a resource for global buildings and construction industry that lays out the core principles and strategies of the circular economy of the built environment in an engaging and accessible way. And I really truly believe we've achieved that. The reasons for the importance of this uh, embracing the circular economy principles 
have already been spelled out, but they will really become apparent further on in the presentation. And the aim of this report is to demonstrate what is possible as time is really starting to run away from us. All the principles are illustrated by best practice case studies, um, and that's from all typologies and all geographies as well, because we want to make this as representative as possible, to give people clear examples of different ways that you can all make a difference. Now, this work should also speak to all stakeholders from across the value chain, from policymakers all the way through to owner and occupiers. And the report is relevant um, for the built environment in its broadest scale, from asset to infrastructure to city and considering the buildings of all uses and classes. In a nutshell, the report is a call to arms for everyone to pause, consider your projects, challenge the status quo, and to start doing things differently from today. So how do we do it? Again, there's some fascinating facts that hopefully people are starting to become aware of on the screen there. And the report flags the imperative need to tackle the built environment. It highlights the way we currently utilize resources in the built environment, and it's unsustainable, our current approach, for three very reasons. The depletion of our finite resources. Our greenhouse gas emissions are accelerating climate change. And the inequalities and the human rights challenges that flow from that. Now, we've already heard some of the stunning um, you know, and really depressing statistics about the built environment. Um, so I won't cover those again. But globally, the circular economy could yield up to four and a half trillion US dollars in economic benefits from today through to 2030. So there's opportunities, and that's what we all need to be viewing. Not, not the challenges and necessarily you know, the blockers, but the opportunities, both financially and doing the right thing, are all there for us to um, see. So the efforts in the climate change um, are focused predominantly on the critical role of renewable energy and energy efficiency measures. Yet these measures can only address 55% of all house gas emissions. Meeting climate targets will require tackling and prioritizing the remaining 45% of emissions, which are associated with the products and things we make and use. The circular economy is therefore the solution to tackling these broader environmental impacts. So what is a circular economy? OK, globally, there are numerous definitions of a circular economy being utilized across all sectors. For this work, the World Green Building Council team analyzed close to 30 academic and industrial definitions and frameworks of the circular economy to establish the fundamental principles. And this analysis presented four primary and unifying principles of circularity for the built environment, which are, as identified on the screen, reduction in consumption of materials and resources, Optimization of land, uh, lifespan for material and product use. Design for disassembly, reuse and recycling and the elimination of all waste and the regeneration of nature. Now, just pausing slightly on the third bullet at that point there, that does not mean that we should be um, putting excessive additional embodied carbon um, in the upfront capital you know, carbon stage of the, uh, our projects. It's about doing it really efficiently. So we shouldn't be utilizing excess carbon now to design for future potential uses. We've got to do it smart. So the circular economy refers to an industrial economy that is restorative by intention. It aims to rely on renewable energy, minimizes, tracks, and eliminates the use of toxic chemicals and eradicates waste through careful design. And that last statement is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So the fundamental principles of a circular economy. At this moment in time, we take, we make, we use, we dispose, and then it's wasteful. We just dump it. And the circular economy looks at joining the, those, uh, that circle. And really, it is about, you know, really focusing on using low, in the take section, it really is using local, um, materials, trying to reuse materials as far as practically possible, and also look at na natural materials. In the make section, it's about being energy efficient, about reusing um, materials where we can. It is about low embodied carbon, and it is about 
making sure that we're specifying and using renewable energy. During the use stage, it is about long life and maintaining the assets that we have created. And then in the retrofit, we have to prioritize retrofit and the reuse over uh, demolition. So unlike lin linear e economic models, in which case resources are disposed of at the end of the initial function, we have to be looking at how do we reuse through the whole life cycle. So within the circular built environment, next slide, please. All stakeholders in the built environment value chain have a role in enabling circular solutions at scale. A circular built environment will require engagement from all stakeholders in the system. The World Green Building Council calls all actors from across the value chain to embrace the necessary actions to become truly circular ready now as the necessary market conditions are put into place to create a thriving regenerative economy operating in alignment with planetary boundaries. Addressing the existing gaps in education and skills will be crucial as the circular economy is a concept that requires all stakeholders to think and act differently. Transitioning to a full circular economy within the, within the built environment will require urgent and large scale action from all parts of society, particularly supported by both regulatory enforcement from the public sector and leadership of the private sector. Next slide, thank you. So all materials and buildings have a carbon footprint as a result of embodied carbon emissions generated when we extract resources and materials or when we repurpose and uh, existing products and building parts. By 2050, the global demand for conventional materials such as steel, cement and aluminium is projected to increase by a factor of two to four. Materials and products with circular pro properties that are non-toxic, minimize natural resource depletion, are renewable and include secondary materials will be vital moving forward. And this chapter of the playbook walks through seven key concepts and uh, presenting case studies to illustrate each strategy in action. One such case study is the recycled homes in Denmark. So these three apartment buildings were built between 1990 and 1994. And they're built from 80 to 90 percent recycled materials. Now, the aim was to obviously to really experiment and to drive the, the thought process and make sure that systems are starting to be put in place. And what's encouraging is, you know, what's that 40 years on review of those buildings has shown similar durability as, you know, more traditionally designed and builder houses. There's been no additional maintenance. And in addition to that, the residents are proud to be part of something that's been reused. So that is something I think that we also need to be embarking on. It's looking at how public perception can really help drive the transition. Next slide, please. So the second chapter of the report is about circular building design and construction strategies. And it is looking at how designers of buildings and infrastructure are well placed to challenge business as usual approaches and unleash forward looking designs that consider the entire life cycle of an asset. So we need to challenge short term thinking. All stakeholders must take a long term view. We've got to design for reuse of, over multiple lifetimes. But like I said earlier, without significantly increasing upfront carbon now, because we do not want to be designing for potential changes 20, 30, 40 years down the line when our materials will have been decarbonized. We've got to design for disassembly and deconstruction, and we've got to design out waste. And we've got to be using resources really efficiently from the design stage to plan to use available materials, materials as effectively as possible to minimize the amounts used during an asset's construction and operation. We've also got to adopt a zero to landfill approach um, to make sure that we're not wasting and dumping any surplus. We've got to be designing that out. So on the next slide, please. Thank you. So regenerative model emulates our natural systems. We've got to be looking at nature-based processes as our species die out at a rate not seen since a mass extinction 66 million years ago. And today, five of the nine planetary boundaries that measure environmental health across land, water and air have been broken, 
A circular economy could reverse this by reducing global material extraction and use by one third. The built environment has used nature as an inspiration for many applications. However, cities and buildings could extend the use of nature-based principles, developing solutions inspired by nature natural circles. A circular built environment aims to integrate nature-based solutions in order to close resource loops and reduce new resource consumptions. And this chapter dives into two focus strategies of how to regenerate nature in the built environment, such as a bi biometric approach that applies the principles of living things effectiveness to the design of products, buildings, services, or even organizations. And also by actively regenerating lands within our cities. Instead of urban sprawl and expanding on virgin ground, regenerative urban development should allow for denser cities by redeveloping and regenerating the existing urban fabric, restoring the, like, the relationship between resources and uh, the natural environment systems. So the final chapter of this report is the levers for change to implement the circular economy through the building and construction sector. Mass market action towards a circular economy will require a compelling value proposition for all built environment actors in both the public and private sector. A key part of the business case for circular economy, as well as being an enabler of a closed loop future, is the use of innovation and business models such as product as a service. This builds on work that the World Green Building Council have done before, such as the flagship Beyond the Business Case report launched at COP26, as well as um, further research about creating a business case from circular buildings. Next slide, please. So the key drivers and levers for change are circular procurement, exploring the public sector leadership, and the role of ESG frameworks to make sure that within every product and every uh, project that we're working on, that we are specifying and driving this down through the supply chain. Next slide, thank you. So as part of the call to action for this report, the World Green Building Council has created a circular ready built environment checklist, which is on the screen now, as we recognize that all stakeholders need to take action to create a closed loop system. We advocate that all actors in the built environment must be circular ready and lead the sector towards a business as usual approach to circularity. So be bold, challenge your clients to be future ready and be, become an early adopter in the transition that is occurring. So just pulling my section to a close, please do uh, put your uh, phone to the, uh, um, the link on the screen now to download the report. And thank you to everyone else for their contribution in the creation of this fantastic resource for everyone to share. Thank you so much, David. You did a fantastic job walking us through that. And thank you for giving us the shout out to your fantastic cheerleader for this publication. We've got a couple of minutes and we've got some really interesting questions that are coming in as you've been speaking. So I'd love to pass on one or two. Um, before we hand over to our panel, but the first is from Michelle, who's sustainability lead at RSHP, who is asking, what do you think are the biggest to adopt circular economy? Which, reflecting on what you said at the beginning about us needing to challenge the status quo, I'm interested in your thoughts about. She's added, we're finding that many manufacturers state that their products can be recyclable, but they don't have a recycling plan. It's difficult to find one. So they're recyclable in theory, but not in practice. So that's an example of one of the struggles, but what else are you finding in your work at WSP? I, I think the key challenge, like you said, is liaising with suppliers and highlighting to them that, um, you know, the future, and trying to get this in our specifications and uh, into our projects, and we require evidence that we can be reusing and recycling these materials in the future. Um, and it really is given that signal that um, only those products that can be reused in the future will be the ones that will be specified. So it is about driving that robustly down through all levels of the supply chain. And we've all got to be mindful that, and I hate saying this, but we are on a journey. We can't expect it all to happen tomorrow, but we need to be really mindful that we need to be making significant strides forward 
over the course of the next three, four, five years. So we need to be inserting those requirements in our procurement plans, in our specifications, reaching out to the supply chain and showing those early adopters who are actually producing those materials that those are going to be weighted very heavily in our decision making process. And that's, again, a clear sign that early adopters will, um, yeah, that they will start generating further income and the people who are lagging behind, um, they're going to see their market share falling. So we, we've got to use the economy and the tools we have to our advantage. Totally. As you just said, it's all about making the business case, isn't it? Absolutely. Thank you. And I loved what you said at the beginning. I wrote it down, actually, what you said about how we need to pause, consider, challenge the status quo and start today. And I think it's a really nice, almost meditative takeaway for our audience today that you're right, we're not going to be able to do everything at once, but let's start with with what we can do. Uh, absolutely, because I think we're all hardwired to try to do the easy thing. And the easy thing is what we've done in the last 5, 10, 15 years. Now, the old ways are working. We can see what they've been doing to the planet. So we need to pause and not utilize what we've done before. So we've all got to be brave. It's not easy for any of us, but we have to pause and look at how can we do something different and work with your clients, work with all your stakeholders to make that difference now. Thanks, David. Those are great uh, closing remarks from you. Thank you so much. A call for courage from David from WSP. Thank you for walking us through the playbook. And with that, thank you, David. It's time for our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And moving us swiftly on, we're joined here today by four fantastic panelists who are going to bring expertise that represent different stages from across the value chain. There are loads of fantastic questions coming in um, in the Q&A box. So our first moderator, Ella, will do her best to weave. And I'll also suggest that some of our panelists and speakers are answering them live as well. So there's obviously a huge amount to discuss. Keep sharing your questions. We'll get to as many as we can. So it's my pleasure to introduce, first of all, Ella Latinen, who is a circularity specialist in sustainable construction at the Green Building Council of Finland. Ella leads Finland GVC's circular economy projects and works on several projects that develop the industry's circular economy, know-how and education. Ella's motivated by making sustainability knowledge available to everyone and helping organizations and teams in the sustainability transition. And she is going to be moderating this panel today, which also includes Dorota Bakal, who is the sustainability and innovation lead at VinZero in the Australia, New Zealand region. She holds a PhD in renewable energy alongside a degree in applied physics and a postgraduate certificate in sustainable business management. Dorota is a certified emissions accountant with expertise in renewable energy and energy efficiency, and she supports VinZero's clients in growing their internal proficiency within the sustainability space. Next, we have Jana Baiskata, who is Head of EU Public Affairs at Kingspan and has worked on EU public policy and regulations in Brussels for over 25 years, focusing on environmental and sustainability policy in the building sector, and she's worked for the Kingspan Group since 2020. Finally, we're joined by Magash Naidu, who heads Circular Development at ICLE World Secretariat. Magash is responsible for the strategic direction of ICLE's circular development work, overseeing key projects and fostering strategic relationships to bring about sustainable systemic change. Previously, he spent 14 years with the Efekweni municipality in South Africa in departments such as the Energy Office, and he holds a doctorate of business from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And with that, that is our fabulous panel. And Ella, it's my pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katrina. For, and uh, I'm very glad for the invitation to moderate this panel. Uh, we all heard uh, from, from David and from Martin uh, what's going on and what, what's, what, what should happen. Uh, there was also a comment from David all, already of the uh, key challenges, which is a thing I'd, I'd like to start our panel with. There is also a question from an anonymous attendee at the Q&A chat about the um, 
uh, translation the, of the principles of circular economy into practice. And uh, I would like to uh, take this as a first question of all, like how should uh, the built environment sector uh, be using and incorporating uh, all these strategies across the supply chain and within uh, the new and also existing assets. Uh, Jonah, would you go first? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Thank you, Ella, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so indeed, uh, uh, we in Kingspan as a um, material manufacturer, which of course is important in the context, uh, uh, are very committed to uh, really developing um, our uh, products to be both uh, lower carbon and uh, circular. And um, the carbon kind of footprint is quite well understood already. And of course, uh, the WBGBSC has been working a lot on that. But circularity is a newer aspect. So I think it's really helpful that we have this report that looks really broadly at the different aspects of circularity. It's, uh, it's helpful for, for stakeholders like ourselves to look at where should we uh, prioritize. And there are good uh, recommendations and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, case studies, which is really helpful. Um, I, uh, one of the recommendations is particularly, I think, uh, uh, pertinent to manufacturers like ourselves. It's that uh, you can't improve what you can't measure. And that's really important. Uh, and we do think it's, it's useful with the other stakeholders together to really build on um, transparent and, and good assessment methodologies for the product looking not only at circularity impact, but all of the different environmental and, and health impacts together to not also have kind of uh, negative impacts from one strand uh, impacting the products on another level. So I think that's really important. Um, and and uh, another point in the construction sector, specifically in the buildings is um, the end of life and all that material, which is out there and how can we work together to kind of find the best secondary solutions to use all that material. I think that's where we as a manufacturer can't stand alone. We all have to kind of work together. So I think uh, that's where collaboration and, and reports like this are really helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Um, how about Magash? What thoughts on, on the difficulties maybe? Perfect. Thanks, Ella, and congratulations to you and the team on the publication of the playbook. I think it's fantastic. A very important signal to the market, uh, not just business, but also uh, government. So really welcome from our side. Um, I may be talking about, I guess, governments and we represent local governments. I guess there's no getting away um, from the fact that they're bureaucratic organizations, right? They're bureaucratic mechanisms and they're like this for many reasons. Uh, for transparency, they use taxpayer funds, and they need to manage multiple um, sectors within a complex environment. So within this rigid system, there's not much maneuvering for innovation and new concepts. And this is why the playbook is so important, is because it sends an important market signal that there needs to be more ambition, there needs to be more innovation. And this then would allow theoretically local governments and some of our political representatives the ability to lobby national governments to change some of these regulations. Because a lot of the regulations sit at, at, at a national level, cities are sort of uh, in control at some at a, at, at a local level. But if cities then go over and above ambition of everybody else, they potentially run the risk of making development in their city too onerous and you know, thereby shifting development to, to, to other cities. So this playbook is vitally important for this collaborative approach that's been pushed. I think it's section 2.2. And this is something that's, that's vitally important. So just from an intervention point of view, not only would this help um, cities understand what the market is currently signaling and the benefits for the environment, the social aspect, um, and, and obviously economic development. But more important than that, I think it also allows cities the opportunity to design and retrofit um, their buildings according, according to these uh, principles, because cities own thousands of buildings um, and have then huge um, procurement power. 
so to speak. So the principles in this book are definitely directly applicable. From a <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm, I'm recovering from a bug. Um, from a, a collaboration point of view, though, I guess it's long been seen that governments, um, you know, govern and, and, and develop policy and then businesses, um, well, I guess, implement within this, these rules. And the angle and the four strategies that are, that are, that are advocated for in, in the playbook, I think are vitally uh, important because if you take a systemic approach to it, we're only able to thoroughly and 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 uh, systemically, I guess, implement it through collaboration. So these uh, playbooks and this market signal, I think, lays a fantastic foundation for further building the trust relationship. Uh, may maybe I stop there and hand back to you, Ella. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you both so far have mentioned uh, transparency, collaboration. Uh, Dorota, would you have something to add there? Well, I, I will definitely second the previous speakers. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for having me here and uh, warm welcome from Sydney. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to see the launch of this report. It's a fantastic piece of work and we were part of, um, you know, the working groups that participate in this one. Now, when you ask me uh, how should we implement the developed strategies that are presented in the report, of course, I would say immediately and fully. Because if you listen to science, uh, we really have no time to waste. But um, from my perspective, it's it's really all about data. And and Joanne, the point that you mentioned that it's really hard to improve. Um, sorry, Jonah, uh, the point that you mentioned that it's really hard to improve uh, something that you cannot measure. It's 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 true. And the slow adoption of the digitalization within our industry is is really a recipe for inefficiencies. And I do believe that uh, the industry should prioritize the digital digitalization and um, use the data insight as an enabler for silicon economy. Use it to drive the efficiency and, and use it to drive reduction of waste and drive the adoption of all of those wonderful recycled, reuse and, and nature-based, low toxic, low carbon materials. And I guess data should also drive um, the decisions throughout the entire life cycle of the building. So from the design and construction to, to operation and the end of life, or actually ideally a start of the new life. Um, one more point I actually wanted to share on this one, and, and that speaks to, to something that David said in, in, in his uh, sort of opening remarks. It is no secret that our industry is extremely fragmented and it's really hard for us to, to develop the consistent standards and practices. So the collaboration and the stakeholder engagements are really key to driving the progress. And um, I guess a note for um, advice from me, if, if I may, this report is really not something that should be read alone in a dark room. You know, it, it's, it must be implemented together with your value chain partners and governments. And only by working together, we can really make significant progress towards circular economy in, a, in the built environment. And finally, and fully um, close this loop. Thank you, Dorota. Uh, very, very strong message. Uh, implementing uh, immediately and fully. I, I really strongly agree with that. But we do have some some barriers <laughs> are, are, uh, on our way there. Um, about the barriers, uh, Jonah, Dorota, would you might have some uh, thoughts on what are the key barriers at this time? I, I can kick off, Jonah. Please do. Uh, well, uh, in terms of barriers, I, I, I guess there is quite a few. Uh, the list is long, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be here. Uh, but if I had to pick one, I would say um, the lack of awareness and understanding on how the Silicon economy solution can be really applied in our everyday operations and, and projects. And I guess this, um, this is why the initiatives such as this report and the broader World GBC Circularity Accelerator are really so important. We need to get engaged and we need to start learning from each other. So I guess homework for everyone today, um, read the case studies featured in the report, 
it's a it's a really good piece of work that that was put together and uh, pick up the pieces that can be applied into your work. That's a really really good start um, a start of 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 you know progressing with the change. But going uh, one step further, um, I do strongly believe that the uh, principles of circular economy and and sustainability strategy should really be embedded into school curriculum. And and actually, the sooner the better. I mean, obviously, not the, the heavy industry language that we use every day. We can soften that, but it's all about driving the behavioral change and um, different way of thinking in our society. And it's so much easier when you do it early on in life. But for us, uh, I guess, working professionals, I would really love to see training programs for the Silk Run economy and perhaps networking opportunities and, and workshops. But what's really important is that they are da data driven and applicable to the audience. And ideally, um, I wish to see that they engage the entire value chain. Very, Jonna. Yes, uh, I think I'd like to highlight here that for uh, materials, and it's been raised in, in the discussion here, a, a barrier uh, is that um, where do you get all this uh, um, kind of uh, secondary technical material, which is out there? What we really need is a good system that will uh, collect and segregate and sort all these secondary materials. And that's um, not something that for companies, it's easy to kind of go and pick up your own uh, used material and do something with it. But we have to work collectively. That's really important. And this is where both regulation and business together should should drive it. And, and I'm talking about extended producer responsibility schemes which set in place this kind of collective um, construction waste collection and sorting and uh, system. Uh, and there's one in, in France, which has started this year, which I really recommend everybody to have a look at. And uh, surely in Europe, we'll be having other countries following the example where everybody has to participate in a collective scheme, uh, which is then financed by contributions. and uh, And that is collecting all the waste uh, together. And that allows, I think, really an incentive for innovation about secondary uses for all those materials. That's really what will bring value to, to all this uh, uh, waste material, which is not there today, which is hard then for companies to find the business models. But this should really uh, bring some uh, a lot of innovation in that sector. Yeah, and, and actually in Finland, we have uh, mo most of our uh, waste sector working like that, that they have to sort it out. Uh, there's actually a great bridge to our um, question from the audience uh, about reverse logistics. Uh, it straight kind of answers to the collecting the secondary materials. Uh, the question go goes, um, reverse logistics for warehousing or transportation is a huge part of circular economy. Uh, what are your thoughts for managing it in the, in the best way possible? Timing, of course, is a key factor for reusing when to collect the materials, when to uh, get it to back to like the um, at the first stages of life. Uh, any thoughts here, Jonah? Maybe. Uh, yeah, just uh, that that's kind of where, for example, the French EPR model comes in, um, finding the secondary solutions for waste materials, really kind of a regional, local question, because you can't start driving around the country with all these materials to find some manufacturing place where you can kind of reuse it for the same purpose. So we really have to be much more creative. And I think we need a uh, both regulation and a sort of business model market driven that will push for finding, you know, the best secondary use at the most cost effective level. So, but I definitely it requires a collective approach. Yeah, I, I highly agree with it has to be done locally or, or somehow in a uh, smaller area than a whole country. <laughs> All right. Uh, there was uh, another huge part of the uh, keynote speaker today was about the social implications of a, the transition to the circular economy. Uh, Magash, you might have some uh, thoughts on that. Uh, who are the winners and losers? Uh, how can we create the just tran transition towards the 
circular and low carbon future? Thanks, Ella. I guess a vitally important question. But first, I mean, maybe it's important to challenge this notion of winners and losers, you know, because do they, I mean, does it always have to be a case where there are winners and losers? Can't they be winners and winners? I mean, maybe this is a utopic view. But um, I mean, just that simple mental positioning would then permeate into all kind of interventions that we develop and, and implement, whether it's, it's government or, or, or businesses. Um, and then unwittingly, you know, um, prejudice some some sectors, of the population um, versus others. Um, just importantly, we're busy with a program right now called just transition um, in, in, in the built environment. It's with Institute of Human Rights and Business, essentially an action research project examining a number of cities to um, assess and map how different actors can influence decision making processes. What we're finding is that, um, you know, there's actually limited just transition um, dialogue or, or uh, interventions within decarbonization process. So it's, it needs to be uh, increased, but just very specifically, um, the implications are disenfranchisement, particularly with, with, uh, with younger, younger people, the negative implications of uh, unemployment with technology changes and innovation needs to be managed. And, um, you know, the social uh, risk that this poses is, is astronomical. And if we don't pay attention, then it's just constantly growing inequality. So what we tend to do to um, and give this a better lens is approach just transition and social equity with three dimensions, if I, if I, if I could. And these are framed across uh, opportunity, access and participation. So if we frame it according to giving people the um, opportunity to participate in policy making and decision making, uh, we're able to understand systems a bit better and make robust, uh, better robust decisions. But also it's about then providing people opportunities for um, economic development, learning, um, upskilling themselves and you know participating in these new industries. But then vitally important is access because I mean, circular buildings that are nice and shiny uh, at the same time perhaps are fantastic, but is it accessible? Is it to, um, you know, is it conducive to open spaces or are we then now excluding access um, to people just from a physical point of view and the psychological dimensions across city level um, for, for, for this is also important. Um, so maybe I stop there, thanks. Thank you. I, I see Dorada nodding very. <laughs> I have something to add. Um, if, actually, no, I, um, I I never thought about it in this way. So, Mangesh, thank you very much for um, bringing up those comments. I, I, I learned together with the audience here. Great, great. I, I think uh, within the circular economy context, we all have a, a, so much things to learn still. Like if, if I've been working two full years with the circular economy, I, I'm very uh, funded every day. Like, oh, there's this aspect and that aspect going on. Yeah, uh, the unemployment and, and upskilling uh, are all... Uh, our know-how is, uh, I'm very passionate about that. Uh, I, I think that everybody should do some little uh, upskilling of, of our know-how uh, every day and some bigger upskilling uh, ev uh, like every year, which we should have lifelong learning. Uh, that, that's a really uh, important part and that also uh, gives, I, I think, uh, business opportunities maybe to uh, to the front runners. Um, Magash, would you like to uh, emphasize a little about what, what's the role uh, of policy versus businesses? Um, difficult question, I, I, I guess, right? So I mean, tra traditionally, if you look at it, policy making is meant to establish what should happen and how it should happen. And I guess then the uh, the role of businesses is to deliver services and a, and a, and a profit, right, to to, to shareholders. Um, I think the world has become very complex, where these um, clear distinctions uh, are no longer applicable. We could follow it, but then it just gives rise to a plethora of unintended consequences. 
and we're we're at the precipice of environmental catastrophe. So what, what I'm trying to say is that this traditional divide of policy and business and academic research and um, um, civil, um, you know, so civil action and participation and so on, needs to intertwine a bit more where the process of policy develop is more, uh, development is more integrated, representative, where there's ownership from everybody so that we're not then focusing kind of on um, very specific objectives and deliverables from the different stakeholders, but we're working to some sort of common survival, um, um, you know, future, because this is how, how bad it is. If you look at the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change reports, it's paints quite a, quite a scary future. So um, more collaboration, more compromise. It's not, uh... It's not policy versus business, it's it's policy um, and business. Right, exactly. right. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. I think also there's going to be uh, a lot of business opportunity with all this secondary material coming into use. And especially, I think, for finding solutions for mixed waste and some, you know, all kind of because buildings weren't built to be taken apart <laughs> before. So there's going to be a lot of challenges. And I think also um, opportunities, which uh, uh, our colleagues in, uh, in, in the uh, industry should look at. Absolutely. Um, a, a big concern for me or something that I've noticed quite a few times is on the economics of the entire sector. Um, it's not exactly a built environment example, but I, I play squash on the weekends um, and my racket, the strings I had cut, the racket cost 30 euros, but to restring the racket cost 30 euros. Most people would just chuck it out and buy a, a new racket. So focusing on the economics and the only way we do this is through integrated, you know, not policy versus business, but perhaps policy for business. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I see that the secondary material use, uh, there are uh, definitely business opportunities, huge ones, but I, I think the policy like won't hold on to that uh, development that we have. And there we should also, also have more collaboration so that the policies would hold on. Oh well, yeah, uh, talking about a little about the business benefits and business opportunities. Um, Jonah, you, you said something about already about the secondary materials. Um, is there something, what kind of new businesses maybe have emerged in your market around uh, circularity, secondary materials, retrofitting, something like that? And what kind of business opportunities have not yet been fulfilled? Where is the need for it? Uh, so I think there's a, a, a this is a big field, and uh, of course we're seeing more demand uh, on lower carbon uh, materials uh, and uh, recycled content. But it's kind of in the in the beginning, so this is where, in a way, uh, we have to look forward. Uh, and as a company, we certainly set our own targets. But uh, of course, what we will really kind of need is some. Uh, larger system like the one the the extended producer responsibility scheme in France to set value and to bring up all this secondary material uh we, we've seen uh, a little bit customer demand on secondary um elements of our materials so some of our uh, construction cut off waste goes to other companies to use for other purposes and that's uh, those are the kind of new business opportunities that we see. Um, we also look at both incorporating bio-based raw materials and uh, recycled materials into our products. So uh, we have to kind of keep all the solutions in mind now for, for the future to find where do you find the best cost-effective kind of uh, solution. Um, and I think, yes, collaboration is needed we work with our suppliers um, uh, regularly to look at what are the op options and opportunities they have of developing uh, more circular and also bio-based raw materials. So that's really key because it's the whole supply chain. One player can only do so much. So very I, true. I, yeah, I, I can actually build on that a little bit, Jonna. Uh, I keep misspelling your name. I'm so sorry, uh, Jonna. 
uh, I, I would like to build on that um, a little bit. From I guess manufacturer perspective, I um, I, I strongly in, encourage more manufacturer more manufacturers to undergo waste audits. It's a really good opportunity to assess your current waste streams and, and identify those opportunities to first of all reduce your waste, but then also repurpose it. And and it's um, it's a great start because it can straight away um, first of all you know reduce our operational expenses from the waste disposal or or the raw materials or products that you uh, purchase and spend money on it, but it can also uh, create additional revenue stream to your company. So when your waste becomes someone else's product, this is where you can start charging money. And, and I think uh, that makes the entire uh, business case for circular economy a little bit easier um, for you to push through your leadership. Yeah, de definitely a business opportunity there. Magaj, would you have something something to add before we move on to our last question? I think Jonah and Dorita are the experts on the business side of things. so. Um, I, I will second what, they, what they've said. Yeah, so uh, as we're uh, closing to the end of the panel, there's a, a quick uh, closing question to all of you. Uh, what are now the next steps needed to fully implement circular principles in the sector? You may have maybe mentioned some, something already, but the key, key message to our audience today. Well, my key message would be definitely to read the report, but then also invite um, some of your value chain partners to the table and start brainstorming. The, um, there is one chapter in the report, I believe it's called Circular Ready Build Environment Checklist. Um, it was mentioned by, um, by, by David when he was describing the report. It is a really good starting point that will help you to spark those conversations and, and engage everyone um, um you know um, together to to drive the change and um one more from me would be don't be afraid to innovate uh, the new technologies and innovative business models can really help you overcome the technical challenges that you might have so i guess just try it out Yeah, from my side, I think I would go back to one of the earlier points about developing better uh, assessment methodologies. It's really important in the built environment to look at the building level and all the impacts together. We used to look at energy efficiency, uh, operational energy. Now, uh, more and more, we're looking at embodied uh, carbon. But uh, circularity is something where we we'll need to develop the, the way to measure it. And next step, uh, there will be biodiversity and there's uh, um, chemical substances. So everything should be looked at together uh, so that we really kind of create a comprehensive framework. And of course, for companies like ourselves, it's important to look long term and to develop our own uh, objectives and targets for our products because it's very important. Perfect. And I guess from my side, um, two important points that come to my mind is first, I think when we talk globally from cities um, and regional governments, I don't think there's a thorough understanding of what circularity actually is. Sometimes it just starts and stops with waste management. So I would um, use this, an advocate for using this playbook as a basis to begin this, uh, you know, um, education process or, or to catalyze it and supplement it. But the second part then is to really understand the um, resource issues we're, we're going to face in the next 10 years. We talk about electrification, we talk about you know, backup energy systems and buildings. When we talk about cobalt, lithium and so on and so forth, in the next 10 plus years, we're going to be having some serious supply issues. So we need to kind of start uh, now <laughs> and we've got to paint this issue this, this this picture of what we stand to lose um, so we can start protecting it very strong messages from all of our panelists i'd like to thank thank you all and uh, I, i'd like to also take this opportunity to uh, welcome everyone uh, participating online to the world circular economy forum that will be uh, happening here live in helsinki but everybody is uh, free 
to uh, participate online. We have uh, on 31st of May, the built environment session, which will be very good. I can say that. Thank you all of the panelists and uh, back to you, Katrina. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thanks for the shout out for the World Circular Economy Forum as well. I'm sure we'll all be tuning into that or looking forward to joining you in person. But Ella, Dorota, Yona, Magash, thank you so much for that really engaging panel session, fascinating conversation. And I really enjoy that although we had four different speakers from different stages of the value chain, you gave us quite a cohesive message. I loved what you all said about working collectively, it not being a responsibility of policy or a business, but it's policy and business that we need for the circular economy. And a lot in there about learning, sharing knowledge, uh, looking at case studies for best practice, and hopefully we can follow um, Magash's leadership and have a situation where we have winners and winners. So thank you for the optimistic overview and thanks to our panel and all of your questions. And with that, let me introduce our final speaker for today who's going to share some closing remarks. Please allow me to introduce Luca De Giovanetti, who's Senior Manager of Built Environment at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Luca leads the decarbonization and circularity work streams of the WBCSD Built Environment Transformation Project. The project mobilizes leading global companies along the value chain to accelerate the transition towards a net zero, circular, nature positive and more equitable built environment. Luca, thank you for joining us. I'll hand over to you now to close our session. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you to uh, the World GBC for the invite. And I think this is a really nice opportunity to strengthen the collaboration with the really, we really had for so many years um, between the organization, as well as well more recently with the uh, Circular Building Coalition. Yeah, having closing remarks after such a great input, I think it's obviously not very easy. But I want just to remind some of the key points on why the built environment on the 40% of global uh, carbon emissions, the one third of uh, resource consumption, but also reminding as well the, the, the um, global wealth in buildings being one half of the global wealth. So it's really an important uh, economical asset as well. Uh, one thing that I think is very clear from this discussion, but in general, it's really important of the circular economy not being only a goal per se, but an essential enabler for the transformation of the market to really address the key challenges of climate change, nature losses, and increasing inequality. So circular economy is really part of the solution. So um, maybe just to remind, just to kind of uh, seconding all speakers about the, the great work of this playbook really summarizing the all important information about uh, circularity so it's really great to find so many information in one place that really provide the full picture on uh, on circularity and really making sense of much work that even ourselves we did and putting them together and providing this great overview and uh, maybe just something that i found very interesting from the comments of the speakers that I found that it was uh, strengthened as well in, uh, in, in the report at the end, where we speak about what we need to do next. Indeed, many of the input of what is the, what is the value of this report and what is needed in the circularity world is really kind of also say there on the, what we want to do next, uh, the importance of uh, collaboration across the entire value chain, really increasing that collaboration, the importance of providing awareness and vision for uh, the sector of where we are, where we need to go, and the measurement, measurement of circularity, providing information of quantifying what we want to do. So this is really kind of important aspect, and I'm pleased that uh, we, we're going to keep working on this going forward, because this is where really what we need to do. And actually, I think what is important as well to remind that solutions exist. We have clear actions. The report actually highlight that. Uh, there is clear action of what we need to do. So we need to start acting on it. And uh, I think, as I uh, uh, said before, in, we need to implement it immediately and fully. So this is really what uh, I find I take from this discussion. Really great. Really looking forward to engage with everybody on the system to really address this. So 
thanks for that. Really great. And uh, looking forward to the next step. Back to you. Thank you, Luca, beautifully summarized. And I love that you've also left us with a really positive remark about um, circular economy being not just a goal, but an enabler as well, that there are co-benefits for us to experience in this process of change. So thank you so much for joining us and wrapping that up for us. And with that, I will move into the close of our webinar. It's time for us to close the session today. And let me thank all of our fantastic speakers who've helped us learn so much more about the urgency of tackling the crises that we face today, but also the opportunity of the circular economy for the built environment and some really practical ways that hopefully we can all take these principles and put into action whatever stage of the value chain one is in. So please do read, download, share and enjoy the Circular Built Environment Playbook that you can access from the link on the screen. Once again, a big thank you and congratulations to all of our team here at World GBC, the Green Building Councils, our partners, uh, our collaborators through the Circular Buildings Coalition and so many other friends and colleagues who've worked together to produce such a fantastic document. And we really hope you enjoy it and are always interested in your feedback. So please do get in touch.